Welcome to Perfectly Paranormal, Episode 20. My name's Anna Schmidt, and I'm here every week to share with you true paranormal encounters and information about devils, demons, and dark energy beings that no one else talks about. And today we're looking at the spirit world here in our Earth reality. Spirits are not technically dark beings, but they're included nonetheless in the paranormal realm. So I'm going to share my thoughts on why they are here. And I have four real life experiences for you to outline some different reasons why they are still amongst us. So get comfortable as we delve into our first story. This is a true life experience from Jody, who is a paranormal researcher in the US, and she shared the following story with me about a local spirit in her community. Jody writes, I had the most unusual experience with my friend who led one of the paranormal groups and my research. His team was called to do a house clearing. A young child in a bedroom was being targeted in addition to the rest of the family, by unseen entities. He asked me to research the property records of the home to which they were doing the clearing. Now, one name on the registry stood out to me, and it took me quite a few minutes to figure out where I'd heard it before. It turned out that previous property owners were a couple who later divorced. Now, the woman's name was Kate, and it turned out that where I'd heard her name before was from a news report of a murder. Kate had been murdered several months before. When I told my client, who was a psychic, he reached out to her. He found out it was Kate who was causing the problems, who had, in the suddenness of her death, gone back to her previous home and didn't realise why other people were living there. My client communicated with her and told her what had happened and all the problems stopped once Kate understood. It was a massive case in our local newspapers at the time. That is something that I find happens quite often is that spirits if they don't know that they've passed or that they really loved their home so much or a particular possession in the home, they will actually return to the property and simply stay there until they are ready to transition into the afterlife. So here's our second story. This is a local story from a sleepy little country town in southern Tasmania. And I've called this story, Harold on the Job. Now, late on a Thursday afternoon, I received a call from Jo. Jo was concerned for her oldest daughter, Kate, who had recently started a new job and felt uncomfortable and scared in the workplace. Now, Kate heard loud footsteps when no one was walking and the creaking and turning of doorknobs. This deep sense of unease filled her mind and body as she sat in the empty office. Kate just couldn't focus on her work as her mind constantly wandered, listening for the sinister footsteps and wondering who was in the building. Now, she wanted this problem solved if she was to work in this place, because quite often Kate was there by herself. And if it didn't get sorted out, she told her mother that she would simply quit. Now, early the following day, I focused on a photo of the building as I remotely looked into the property. And as usual, I asked permission from the land guardians to enter the location and look for and remove any paranormal intruders. So as I closely looked at the photo of the property, I felt the presence of a male energy, very dominating. Like seriously, this male energy was dominating the environment. 
His presence stood silently in the doorway of the building, with his arms folded. Sometimes I can see spirits and dark energy beings, other times I just feel them. But this spirit was so strong and so profound in his desire to be seen (laughs) that he literally popped into my third eye and he looked, he was, I won't tell you what he was yet, otherwise I'll spoil it. But he was amazing and he's still there now doing his job. It's just a lovely, lovely story. Anyway, let's get back to it. Now this presence stood silently in the doorway. He was observing me, this very stern look, just as much as I was observing him very calmly and quietly. I asked through my pendulum dowsing if there was any dark or demonic beings present and was met with a very quick no. And I intuitively knew that this energy being was not from the darker realms. Now I politely inquired if the being was a spirit, and was met with a shuddering wave of annoyance, oh my goodness, which gave me a really irritating headache. Like this spirit had very powerful energy. The presence did not consider himself to be a spirit, ghost, or ghoul, and thought it was quite rude of me to ask. I mean, I had to ask. I always do the questioning. The detective work is part of the process. So I questioned, you know, very cautiously if he needed assistance. And I was met with a very strong feeling of irritation and toe tapping, as if I was wasting his time. Now the name Harry popped into my mind. And then the name was quickly corrected to Harold. I asked if that was his name, and I got a very firm yes. He preferred his proper name. There were no nicknames for Harold. As I spoke with Harold, he suddenly appeared in my workroom. I felt him literally walk through the wall, like I'm facing a window, and he came through the wall next to the window, and his shimmering energy stood very steadily to the right of my desk. He observed me again with his arms folded and he abruptly asked what I wanted as he was on the job. Now, my mind instantly slipped back to another clearing job where I'd heard that term before and I now knew why Harold was at the premises. I very politely explained to him that there was a young lady named Kate now working in the building often alone, and she felt anxious and unsettled when she heard loud footsteps, rattling doorknobs, and felt an ominous presence walking past her room. Being the only person in the office, Kate's mind often ran rampant with fear. Harold told me he'd seen Kate, but didn't realise his presence unsettled her so. He explained in great detail that he was a security guard and was simply doing his twice daily check of the building. He had no intention of leaving the job he loved so much as it gave him a great sense of pride to care for the property. The thought of transitioning into the afterlife was just simply of no interest to Harold as his commitment to the building and its security was top priority for him. After he made that very defined statement, he gave me a quick nod and promptly vanished from my workplace. And I reckon he went straight back to work. Now, I rang Joe the next morning and I was explaining the situation regarding Harold. She said Kate would be so relieved, kind of excited, to think that she had a helpful, diligent spirit watching over the premises day and night. Now when Kate enters the office every morning, she happily calls out, Good morning, Harold, and goes about her work, no longer frightened by his presence. Leaving the office at the end of the day, Kate knows that the building is in good hands, as Harold is on the job. 
I've actually seen this before. I've actually experienced this very same thing before in a prison building that's on the mainland of Australia. A friend of mine's sister is a warden and she stays in one of the buildings on the premises. And she was messaging her sister going, oh, I can't sleep, I don't know what's going on, there's someone in the building, I can't see someone, I just, I just don't feel comfortable. So her sister messaged me. I knew instantly what it was and I tuned in and I did all the, the detective work that I normally do. And I messaged my friend back. I said, look, tell your sister it is a security guard who is on the premises and he's simply just checking the building. He's been there actually since the late 1800s and he just, he loved his job. And I asked him very politely if he could just survey the outside of that building where my friend's sister was sleeping. And after the sister received this message, she kind of thought it was was sweet that he was still there doing his job and she actually found that she slept better and that she wasn't frightened anymore, just the same as Kate, when she understood why the spirit was there. He simply didn't want to go. He loved his work. It's just fascinating. I love the paranormal world. There are just so many things that we can learn and understand about it. Now, I'd like to do a shout out to Dean. Dean was initially a client who has become a good friend, and he's always following my paranormal YouTube channel and my podcast. And Dean wrote, Anna is a great storyteller and educator who has spent the last 35 years or so working with and understanding all types of lower vibrational dark energy beings. Demonic forces are her speciality. I like that. <laughs> Despite what some might regard as dangerous work, Anna handles these dark entities with compassion, respect, and most importantly, a great deal of understanding. And this is how I can work with them, is that I respect them, I understand why they're here, and I just find them fascinating. You know, they're just as fascinated by us as we are by them. He writes, these podcast episodes are entertaining, exciting, and sometimes even a bit scary. But most of all, a great listen. I can't wait for the next one. Thank you, Anna. And also want to share a quick shout out to a very elderly friend of mine here in Tasmania. He wanted to read a copy of my book called The Darkness Around Us. He was a little bit dubious. He's very spiritual and he loves the Druid world. He's very connected to the earth and the trees and the elementals. But he also has a fascination with the paranormal. Now, his very short testimonial about my book was that he found it enthralling, but also he found it slightly unnerving, which it is for a lot of people. I'm used to this stuff. Like, I talk about this as if it's in my home all the time, which they are. But they're really very simple beings. They're not here to attack us and hurt us and kill us like we've been brainwashed into thinking. There's reasons why they're here, as you will listen to during my podcast episodes. Now let's move on to story three. It's called The Visiting Auntie. This is another local case study. I get a lot of people ringing me and I do a lot of local work as well as doing a lot of paranormal work worldwide. This is a story from the early days. Now this lady's called Cassie. And she contacted me to look into some very peculiar activities in her home. She said she was watching TV one night and she could hear a strange sort of churning, whirring sound coming from the kitchen. Now, when Cassie investigated, she found that the plate in her microwave oven was slowly turning of its own accord. Now, the microwave wasn't turned on. And Cassie's like, I don't know what's going on with this. And she knew that I was interested in the paranormal. So she messaged me. Now, this experience happened after Cassie started developing and practicing her psychic awareness and her skills. And she thought that the two might be connected. Now, Cassie wasn't frightened by this strange kitchen occurrence. But for the life of her, she couldn't work out 
why this particular incident was happening. She'd had flickering lights before. She'd had wafting breezes, you know, moving through a home. And they weren't from any open doors or any drafts. So she was kind of used to unusual experiences. But the plate in the microwave, you know, those thick glass plates that sit in the bottom of your microwave, churning away by itself, turning very slowly. Not a usual paranormal occurrence. Now, Cassie lived by herself with her two fur babies. And as she was talking to me on the phone, I repeatedly heard the word in my head, auntie. And I relayed this message to Cassie and she thought about it for a moment. And she suddenly realised who it could be. Not an auntie as in a family member, but a friend who was like an auntie. She was very excited to think that this person had come to say hello and that her attention by activating an electric appliance in her home. Cassie eagerly said that her auntie loved the kitchen and cooking. And guess what appliance was her favourite one in the kitchen? Yep, you're right. The microwave. So the auntie had chosen this piece of kitchen equipment to convey the message that she was present in Cassie's home. Spirits will use things quite often that they relate to. You know, sometimes people say that they smell Nan's perfume or smell Nan's jam or her scones cooking or their grandfather's favourite cigar or there'll be a sound Or there'll be a song that comes on the radio that was their mum's favourite piece of music. Sometimes people even hear a distinctive dog barking when their dog had passed away, you know, six or 12 months ago, and there's no other dogs in the neighbourhood. Each spirit will use a very individualised way of communicating with us. Some of them communicate in our dreams. But Cassie's auntie loved the kitchen, so it makes total sense that she would use a kitchen appliance to communicate with Cassie. Now, the following real-life experience tells of a different tale with a spirit in a house. It depicts other reasons why spirits can be present around us and wanting our attention. Now, this story is called The Angry Gentleman Spirit. Wendy was shopping in a spiritual store and she saw my business card at the front counter. Now, she took my card and called me that afternoon. Now, Wendy's voice was very shaky and she insisted that I visit her home later the same day. Wendy said that she was at her wit's end and she just couldn't cope anymore. So she gave me her address and I packed my bag and went to my car. Now you're going to find this interesting. As I was sitting in my vehicle, typing her address into my iPad, I was suddenly hit with this barrage of loud, abusive swear words in my mind. Now, it was in my head. It was a quiet afternoon. There were no people around me. And they were the worst possible words that you can think of. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to observe what's going on. I'm not going to respond. There'll be a reason why this is happening. Now, this very vocal bombardment continued for the entire 25-minute drive It really tested my patience and I even turned up the radio in an attempt to drown out the voice. Now, this type of behaviour is consistent with spirits who don't want you to go to their location. They're not sure who you are. They can see that you do energy work. They can see that your vibration or that your auric field is different to other people. But out of fear, they don't know how you're going to treat them. So they'll use every tactic that they can come up with to keep you away. 
Now, when I arrived at Wendy's home, the voice suddenly stopped. And the silence was an absolute blessing. Now, I got out of my car and I stood looking up at Wendy's unit. And in one of the windows, I saw a very thin, wispy silhouette shift behind one of the curtains. And I said to the spirit, I'm here to help. So I walked up the stairs and went round to Wendy's back door. And she greeted me with a baby sitting on her left hip. Now Wendy looked exhausted and her skin was a very unhealthy pale grey colour. The unit where she lived was small and there were baby's toys strewn from one end to the other, as you would expect, you know, in a toddler's house. Now Wendy pushed the toys out of the way so that I could walk to the couch where we sat and we discussed what was happening in her home. She explained about how night times were the worst when she and her two small children were in bed. The TV would turn on by itself, mugs would fall off the kitchen bench and the children's electronic toys would turn themselves on. Now as Wendy's talking, I'm really eager to communicate with this wispy figure who had been watching me from the window. And I asked Wendy if I could walk around the unit. Now, I primarily use my body as a dowsing tool. It's like a paranormal radar is what I call it now, or my spidey senses, if you want to look at it that way. And I'll just walk around buildings and I'll get tingly feelings, I'll get brain fog, my stomach might hurt, my walking might change, my speech can become quite erratic, or I can get heart palpitations when there's spiritual energies or dark energy beings present. Now, when I walked around Wendy's unit, every room was warm and had free-flowing energy except for Wendy's bedroom, which kind of felt heavy and dense and very, very uninviting. I don't know how she actually slept in there. Seriously, there was energy sort of repelling me from wanting to enter that room. But I just stood there calmly and peacefully. And as soon as I opened the door further, I felt that very strong presence that I'd seen in the window. It stood very defiantly in one spot. Similar to Harold with his arms folded. This energy being was older. It had an elderly feel about it. But it was very strong, not very happy. Now, this being just stood in one spot, like I said. It wasn't moving and probably hoping that I wouldn't sense its presence. But I signalled to Wendy that this was the room where the disturbance was coming from and I asked her if I could sit on the bed. Now, as I sat on this large, soft bed, I found myself smoothing out the wrinkled doona cover, just sort of quietly humming to myself. Then I spoke really quietly, not wanting to frighten or upset the spirit, and I said, I know you're here. I'm here to help you. This home belongs to Wendy and her children now, and it's time for you to move on. I felt a quite strong, sort of energetic shift in the corner of the room, and then I suddenly saw the image of an elderly gentleman in my third eye. I'll never forget it. Granddad pants, braces, flannelette shirt, you know, hair sort of combed over, really strong sort of piercing eyes, but kind of sad at the same time. Like he presented himself in my third eye. It was like I had my eyes open, but I could see in my mind at the same time, if that makes sense. It was as if he'd uncloaked himself to reveal his presence to me, and he looked really annoyed. His face was red and all puffed up, and his beady brown eyes sort of stared at me in annoyance. And in a gruff voice, he said, My house! I kept just sort of delicately smoothing the doona cover in very circular motions. And I said to him, Do you know that you've died? There was no answer. I waited for a moment, and then I quietly said, 
I can help you. I felt the presence shuffle closer, like there was a change of energy around where I was sitting. And he stood next to the bed. And it was as if the penny had dropped for poor Darlin. He'd been there so long. He said how upset he was that his lovely tidy home was messy with toys and children and how he didn't like children at all. He asked me what year it was and realised that he died two years earlier. He'd been aimlessly existing in his unit for two years. He said his wife had died unexpectedly and the loneliness was more than he could bear. He said he went to sleep one night and and simply not woken up again. The man's energy had now shifted from angry and full of hatred to helpless and full of despair. I looked him in the eyes and I said, you can go to your wife. She's waiting for you at the golden doorway. I can release your attachment to the earth plane and you can go to her. His despair instantly disappeared and he was now kind of excited. Like I can still see him in my mind. He was hopping from one foot to the other and his eyes were were just hopeful and, and, and excited in a way. He kind of quickly tidied himself up by, you know, tucking in his shirt and slicking back his hair. And he closed his eyes in anticipation. I still get emotional when I think about this story. His peaceful transition. Ah, oh, look, seriously, he just gave himself to the light. And I caught a glimpse of his wife sort of meeting him at what I used to call in those days the golden doorway which is that threshold, that crossing point. She was there waiting for him. And off they went, arm in arm, into the great beyond. Now, Wendy had been silently watching me from the bedroom doorway, and she instantly felt a dramatic temperature shift in the room, from stony cold to warm and cosy. We discussed what had taken place and Wendy had such a look of relief on her face. Now, when I called in to see Wendy two weeks later, she had spring cleaned the whole unit. Her bedroom felt light and airy and she said both the toys and the TV had stopped turning themselves on. And she said that her energy had returned. And I could see that her skin had returned to its usual sort of soft pink colour. She was so happy. She was happy for herself and her children, but she was also really happy for the elderly gentleman spirit who'd been reunited with his wife. Wendy said that this experience gave her a deeper understanding of life after death. Now for our next story... Unspoken words and emotions can sometimes keep spirits attached to the earth realm until they have their say, as you will hear in this following account of Jim and Tom, which I've called, Why Weren't You There? Now, Jim's wife, Tess, contacted me one day because of some strange goings on in their home such as cupboard doors in the kitchen would just fly open when there was no one near them. There was a dense patch of energy in the hallway which made the children feel very uncomfortable. And Tess's partner found that his favourite coffee mug somehow mysteriously fallen off the top of the fridge in the middle of the night. Now, when I remotely tuned into the family home, there was a male spirit present. It wasn't ominous or frightening but he had something to say. His energy was that of a young man. He felt like he was in his teens or his early 20s. And he felt like a long-term friend of the family. He was intent on speaking to Jim and he would not go until he had his say. Now, I relayed this information to Tess and she and Jim talked about who he could possibly be. 
Now, later that day, Tess messaged me to say that it could be one of Jim's friends named Tom, who had died recently. Now, I asked the young male spirit who'd been standing by my side listening to the phone call, and he said indeed that his name was Tom. And in my third eye, I could see him nodding frantically. He really, really, really wanted to talk to Jim. I could feel this mixture of strong emotions emanating from Tom. He was kind of angry, sad, excited and relieved all at the same time. Finally, he could have his say. Now, Jim was a bit of a hard nut to crack. Jim didn't believe in the afterlife, spirits or anything outside the ordinary tangible world around him. But this was soon to change as Tom wanted to speak to him. Now, I talked to Tess through the phone as Jim was having the conversation with Tom, just to be there as a little bit of moral support. I could hear Jim. He was kind of flustered, like he was pacing the room. He didn't know what to do or what to say. So I asked him to relax and just visualise his mate in his mind. And I said, just talk to him as if he's sitting there next to you. Tom asked me to pass on a question to Jim. Why didn't you come to my funeral, he asked. I thought we were great mates, brothers even. And you didn't come to see me off. There was silence at the other end of the phone. And then there was this sort of muffled conversation. And I could hear Jim talking to Tom and explaining what had happened and why he wasn't actually at the funeral and that he actually was so distraught by the thought of losing his mate that he couldn't bring himself to look at him in the coffin. He just he just couldn't do it. And he didn't know at the time how to talk to Tom. He didn't feel that his friend would hear him and he actually felt a bit crazy talking to someone that he couldn't see. But now he understood that Tom was still here. Tom was waiting. Tom wouldn't go into the afterlife until he had spoken to his best friend. Once Tom realised that their mateship had been restored, isn't the power of communication wonderful? And it can really heal the living and also the non-living. In that moment, Tom relinquished his attachment to the earth realm and he simply vanished from my mind. He vanished from my thoughts. I didn't feel his energy around me anymore. And I could hear Jim crying on the other end of the phone and his wife was hugging him. And it was just such a relief for both of them. You know, what a healing experience. You know, I get so emotional when I tell these stories. It's like I'm experiencing them all over again. But just because people leave their physical bodies, their soul energy can still be here. Their personalities are the same. They're just not in these physical, tangible bodies. And I was so happy to be able to be part of restoring this mateship between these two young men. Now, if you like this podcast, please feel free to follow, subscribe, share it with your friends. Help me to get this message out there about why spirits are here, why dark and demonic beings are here. And just learn and understand that the paranormal world is actually not as frightening as what we think it is. And as you've heard, spirits are just people's soul energy that have left their own as physical bodies. Now, there's many reasons why spirits stay within the earth reality. As you've heard in the four stories that I've told today, some people die suddenly and don't know that they've left their bodies and they just continue to live in their homes and go about their routine daily activities, just as described with the angry gentleman story. Others remain because they want to pass on messages to loved ones or Some of them are a little bit uncertain about what happens when they leave their earthly home. You know, where where am I going to go? No one really knows what the afterlife is until we actually get there. 
We can only speculate. So they choose to go on inhabiting their homes, you know, following around family members or lingering in previous workplaces or sometimes lingering where they have died. And when these people's homes and properties are sold and new owners move in, spirits can get really confused, annoyed and, you know, just anxious about what's happening. Now, some spirits may be interactive and make their presence known, you know, using various environmental methods, such as footsteps in the night, moving or misplacing objects, turning on electrical items like Cassie's microwave. There can also be light flickering and sometimes door slamming, sudden chills in the air. Blasts of cold air around you are one of the common signs that there are spirits present in our reality. And some people can even experience sleep or dream disturbances. Animals quite often will see the presence of invisible beings, you know, the unseen around us. Animals that they'll just follow, their eyes will follow around rooms. They'll look at corners, they'll stare. It's they're simply just picking up the presence of an energetic being. Now, some spirits are simply going about their duties as when they are alive. I've spent a lot of time in places such as a local hospital here in Tasmania that's no longer used as a hospital, where there are still medical staff present. You know, right from the cleaners, the technical staff such as electricians, right through to the nursing staff and the specialist doctors. They're all still there going about their jobs. I just want to do a little shout out to Dr. Philip in that particular location. Dr. Philip showed up. Here's another little short story for you. I was in a room doing some cleaning because a friend of mine was going to be running paranormal tours in this building. And I've got, you know, head down, mop in hand, cleaning the floor, you know, doing some dusting. All of a sudden, in my mind, I saw a very prominent man in sort of like a a lab coat. He had a suit underneath, he had this lab coat on top, tie, moustache, glasses, sort of hair slightly combed over, very strong facial features. And in my head, I heard, Philip, okay, I'm just going to remember that. When I spoke to my friend who actually sees spirits very prominently, he's the x-ray specialist. And Philip isn't his name, he's Dr. Philip or Mr. Philip. So every time I would enter that building, I would always do a shout out to Dr. Philip. It's kind of funny because he saw me at the cleaner level of the staff, which is really funny because my friend who does the paranormal tours in this hospital, she is actually trained as a medical professional. And because she is in a location that is filled with medical professional spirits, they acknowledge her knowledge. They simply give her the regards of being a medical staff member. I didn't relate to the spirits in this building at all. I felt very out of place, not in a a dangerous or an upset way. I just felt like I didn't belong because they were all medical professionals. Lots of doctors, lots of sisters, lots of nursing staff. Okay, so who I related to were the patients and the children that were still there. And some of the nursing staff that lived in the nursing home that was on the premises. Now, we're still talking spirits here. This is a building that is no longer used as a hospital. And once Dr. Philip and the staff got used to people being in the property, this is another little funny thing that just came to mind. I'm quite loud, as you can imagine. I talk a lot. They're used to this hospital being totally quiet. And along comes Anna with her big boots and her loud mouth. It was really quite funny. I was told quite often to, shh, be quiet, shh. And my friend would come and tell me, they're telling me to tell you that you're too loud. They actually grew accustomed to me after a while because they could see that I meant well and that my energy is very kind and very generous and I learned to respect their workplace. Now, as I've mentioned in other podcast episodes, a lot of people are very psychically and spiritually open. There's a lot of energy workers around. 
There's a lot of people that don't actually put out there that they do healing or that they do energy work, but they're very open to the spirit world. You know, some are openly open. Some don't even know they've got the skills. And spirits will follow people. So you might feel like there's someone following you around. You don't know why they're there. You might think they're malevolent. They're not actually. They're like, I can see you. You're a healer or you're an energy transitioner. You can help me leave the earth realm. I've worked with a lot of teenagers who very, very open spiritually. And I've helped them understand that sometimes spirits will go to people because they think you can help them. They don't understand that you don't have the abilities or don't want the abilities or you're frightened to use the abilities. So what I say to people is, if you feel that you've got someone around you, that they're just following you and you feel uncomfortable, you just say to them, I can't help you, please leave my home. Or I can't help you, can you please find somebody else? Or if you know someone that does energy clearing, quite often I'll say to people, send the spirits to that person. And once they understand that you don't want to help them or you can't, they'll go. The spirits just assume that you can help them because your energy shines in a different way. Your auric field pumps out a vibration that says you're an energy clearer, you're psychically open, and they're drawn to people like that. So I've learned about this through my journey. And sometimes people wait for their past loved ones to come and visit them. And it doesn't always happen. Past loved ones may try and contact you, but if you're unaware or you're so grief stricken that you can't see the signs, you're just unable to see the signs because of the emotional energy that's in the way, they're not going to be able to get through to you. So they may go to somebody else to give you a message. So it's not that when your past loved ones leave the earth realm that they forget about you, it's that sometimes they just can't communicate. Because spirits are all on their own learning journey. Once their soul energy leaves their body, they have to learn how to be a spirit. It's not like they leave this physical body and they know everything about the universe, which is what a lot of people think. But I don't think that because I had interactions with spirits where they're like, can't communicate this way, but I can show you something this way. It's like they've got different skill sets or maybe they have to learn how to use their skill sets to communicate with people if they wish to. Now, quite often people who want to connect with those that have passed, but they don't feel they have the psychic skills, they're not psychically open, I say to them, ask your loved one to come to you in your dreams. This is a way when the mind is relaxed and spiritual energy, the spirit realm can actually connect with us easier when the mind is relaxed. And a lot of people tell me about their experiences they dreamed of their mom or their dad at their favorite location or they were at their favorite park or patting their favorite pet it's just fascinating how non-physical beings can actually communicate with us in these physical bodies so i hope you've enjoyed listening to these four stories today and have learned something new about the ways in which Spirits interact with us and the environment around us. So in episode 21, we're looking at part two of paranormal addiction. As I've had many requests, many emails, people wanting to know more. So we're going to look in depth at the signs and symptoms that I personally have experienced and what I've witnessed in my clients and others around me who have this sometimes detrimental craving for paranormal knowledge. Thank you for joining me today. And if you want to share a paranormal experience or you've got a question, you can email me at spiritualbeing44 at gmail.com. And for information on paranormal house clearing, 
you can find my web address in the description box. And for information on paranormal house clearing, you can find my web address in the description box. And I look forward to sharing this spooky space again with you next week. And remember, life is perfectly paranormal. <laughs>